So the next talk is uh, work by Basil Furrad, Andreas Lochbiela, Joshua Schneider, Dimitri Tretel, uh, Quotients of Bounded Natural Functors. And uh, Dimitri, you're on. Thank you, Jeremy. So actually, we decided to structure this as a small play. So it's the two of us who will be talking, in particular, Andreas will play Andreas, an Isabel expert. And I will play Dmitri, a working formalizer, and also be the narrator. And finally, we have also some support from Isabel, who will assist us with our proofs. So let's jump right into it. Uh, I have a formalization, and I need help with it. I'm trying to formalize uh, the Giacomos and Vardy's linear dynamic logic, and I cannot even define the syntax the way I want it. Well, that's surprising me as an Isabel developer. Syntax usually isn't a problem. Have you tried using an inductive data type? Yes, uh, but uh, there is a twist. So it all starts with the type of regular expressions, which are shown here. And uh, the atoms of regular expressions are polymorphic. So in particular, the type variable A is the alphabet of our regular expression. No problem with that. Uh, we have several formalizations of regular expressions uh, in Isabel, so maybe you could even reuse one. Indeed, no problem so far. Um, and here comes the type of uh, formulas of linear dynamic logic. So note that the atoms of regular expressions are formulas again. No problem there either. So even so LDL recurs to through this other type constructor RE, since RE is a data type, um, the Isabel data type package can handle that. I've heard that this is called nested recursion. So, but here comes the twist. Um, they have, this declaration works, but what I want is to have not just nested recursions through the regular expression type, but I want to consider regular expressions module and equivalence relation. And here is the equivalence relation I want to consider. It is the associativity, commutativity, and idempotence of the alternation constructor of regular expressions. Oh, I dimly remember having heard around ACI equivalents and regular expression in the context of Brz whatever derivatives. Precisely. So those are called Brzezowski derivatives. And if you consider regular expressions module of this equivalence relations, for certain constructions, you get a finite set where you usually would get an infinite one. And having finite sets is extremely uh, useful for proofs. So now what I want to do is not to consider this data type, but rather consider the quotient module of this equivalence relation and also in my formula type. Is the quotient. I start to see the problem. Indeed. So the Isabel data type command will complain, telling me that there is a unre an unsupported recursive occurrence of the type LDL via the type constructor RE modulo ACI in this type expression. Well, yes. So um, the data type package doesn't support recursion through any type constructor. Um, that's why I mentioned other data types are fine. But technically, um, it, uh, we need some semantic properties there. And they're usually called BNF for bounded natural factor. And that's actually what the second part um, of the error message tells you. I see, although I don't know yet what BNFs are. Let me make a short break and tell you what the contribution of our paper is. In our paper, we identified a sufficient condition on when quotients of BNFs, whatever those are, uh, but for example, we have just seen one such quotient of a BNF. And we would like to know that those types are BNFs, BNFs themselves. So in the paper, we give a sufficient condition for, for this. Um, and this is not only relevant for data types, as we've seen, it's also relevant for co-inductive data types, but there are also applications of BNFs beyond those uh, type declarations, namely relational parametricity and refinement. So this is a more theoretical contribution. There is also a practical contribution in our paper, namely the implementation or the extension of the lift BNF command to support this lifting of the BNF structure from a type to some quotient of that type. Right, so let me briefly explain why we have this restriction in place. Um, 
that actually goes back to a paper by Elsa Gunter in the mid 90s. So it was uh, TP Halls back then, um, or even the predecessor of it. Basically, um, if we were to allow arbitrary recursion, we could write something like this bad data type down here where the recursion to go through the set type constructor. And as a result of that declaration, we get basically a constructor. And constructors and data types are injective. So we get an injection from a power set into the set of values um, that we're having. And there is no such solution uh, in the uh, standard SAS theoretical model of whole. And so we would get an inconsistent logic if we allowed to, uh, that. And that's the reason why Isabel allows only recursion through uh, bounded natural factors, which are a semantic characterization of what, what's there. So to give you an idea of what that is, um, let's start with the three words, bounded natural factors. So let's start with a factor. Well, a factor basically takes um, a set of atoms A and constructs certain values, and the running example will be just lists. Um, and these values use these atoms in there. And the construction is systematic, meaning if I take a different, what? Dimitri, what did you do to our slides? I don't know. They are blank. They are up to date. Sorry for that. I will just open them anew. Right. So um, you can do that not only for one set of atoms, but you can do that systematically for a different set of atoms. And the interesting part for um, a factor is that you can lift operations. So if you have a function from set A to B, then that translates to a function on the constructed values by transforming the atoms accordingly uh, and preserving the shape. It has to satisfy a bunch of properties. That's the F part. The bounded part means well, even so, we're saying, OK, those values down here are constructed using these atoms. They don't have to use all of the atoms up there. So there's essentially the inverse operation, the setter, which returns the set of uh, atoms that are actually in there. And the bound here says, well, we must be able to specify a fixed cardinal bound. So it can be arbitrarily large, infinite, whatever but it needs to be fixed independent of the value that we're currently looking at. And this rules out the power set constructor that we saw in the previous slide. And the setter must be natural, meaning, well, it works together with the mapper in terms of how they operate with lifting. So if we map the elements of the set, then the result of mapping the function over the value and then going back that should commute under two rules on the right hand side are there. Um, if you're familiar with category theory, this has been studied a lot. So the setter like this exists if and only if the functor preserves uh, wide intersections, meaning if I have a system of uh, atoms and take their intersections, the values I can construct over those are exactly those that I can construct construct over uh, if, if I construct them, well, that are constructible over every set in there. And it needs to preserve uh, pre-images as well, but um, that's something less relevant for this talk. And then we can, uh, one other component here is essentially a relator, which can be defined using the, uh, the, the mapper and the functor. And that relator uh, generalizes the mapper in, the sense that it lifts relation rather than functions from the atoms uh, to the constructed values. And it must preserve weak pullbacks or a notion of distributivity over relation composition. So that's found in natural factors. Thanks. So now I know what they are abstractly, and I somehow understand that lists must be one. But can you give me some more concrete examples? Sure. Um, so there are first a few basic bounded natural factors like the sum type, the product types, 
function space uh, if we consider this as a unary functor in the codomain, so the positive position. And there are a few non b nerves that we know, like the set here, which is ruled out by the bound. Um, the function type, if we consider it as a uh, functor in the argument position, because that's a negative position and uh, would then be contravariant at the map of which is not work. And based on these very simple building blocks, you can then construct a lot more. For example, you can, can compose bounded natural functor, and you get something like unit plus a product, and that would be a bifunctor. And then the important application for data types is that bounded natural functors are closed under fixed points, um, well, least and greatest. So lists are naturally a uh, bounded natural functor, strings, and the like. And then subtypes, conditions apply, like a balanced tree are also um, bounded natural factors. Uh -huh. So I start to understand. So the, my first declaration that used nested recursion through regular expressions worked because regular expressions are data type and therefore Isabel knew that it's a bounded natural factor. Precisely. Whereas if I take the quotient, Isabel does not know. Right. And this gives rise to the uh, error message. Okay, but now you mentioned subtypes, and this brings me to an idea. How about viewing this quotient actually as a subtype? And what I have in mind here is to take some canonical representatives. I'm using here a normalization function, NFACI, that for each regular expression would give me the canonical representative. And I define the type REACI instead as a quotient just by taking the, these normal forms, these canonical representatives. Right. Unfortunately, that approach works for defining the type. It doesn't work for actually lifting the bounded natural function stru uh, structure because, as I said, conditions apply. Mm -hmm. One of the conditions is that if you have such a normal form, then no matter how you transform the atoms in it using the mapper, it still has to remain a normal form. So if you apply a non-injective function f here, that non-injective function may make atoms equal and therefore might destroy your normal form property mm. and so land out of the type and so you can't do the lifting that way. I understand. So to summarize, quotients can be viewed as subtypes via representatives, but we cannot lift the BNF structure this way. So what can we do instead? Well, uh, last year at ITP, um, Jeremy Abigard and colleagues have presented a more general version called quotients of polynomial factors and that ha has been formalized in Lean. So their idea was to precisely look at quotients. Um, so here we have our factor again. Let's suppose we have some sort of equivalence relation on that. And now we want to build a quotient and just look at the equivalence classes. So their more general approach basically had one requirement, namely, that the mapper should respect the equivalence classes, meaning if you take equivalent elements, then the result is again equivalent. And if that's the case, um, then they can do their construction. But of course, it's more general, so you get less structure. They, however, have a notion of lifting predicates, which is very similar to what the setter does. And if we remember about this wide intersection property, um, what this boils down to basically, if we apply this theory to bounded natural factors, is that we get another requirement. Equivalent values must have the same atoms in them. So it's not only sufficient that they're constructed from the same, but they really must use them. And well, the wide intersection preservation will still need for uh, the naturality conditions to be satisfied. And the weak pullback preservation comes from the related uh, requirement that we have. Um, if you take them together, they actually imply that the map preserves the equivalence classes. So these would be our conditions. Uh -huh. What do you think? So I'm not sure about the last two because they are not specified precisely, but I'm quite certain that for ACI equivalent regular expressions, they have the same sets of atoms. No problem there. All right. Um, sounds good, but before I proceed implementing anything uh, 
of, of this lifting, I would like to try some more examples of quotients. To see if this works. works. So what I have in mind are distinct lists as an example, where we start with ordinary lists, and typically you think of distinct lists as a subtype. Maybe you take those lists that do not have duplicate elements. Um, however, I believe if I want to lift the BNF structure from lists to distinct lists, I will run into the same problem as with regular expressions, namely if I map with a non-injective function, I will end up outside of my distinct list type. Precisely. So this does not work. So why don't we look at the quotient instead? Namely, instead of throwing out the elements that are not distinct, we simply identify them in a single equivalence class uh, um, by taking, for example, the representative uh, as a representative of the distinct list. Right. And um, if I think of the conditions that you outlined, uh, again, the same is true. So uh, for all the lists in one equivalence class, we have the same atoms. So this should work. And you are the expert on the other two conditions. Hopefully, you will tell me that they also work. Indeed, that looks good. OK, sounds good. Let's do one more example. And this one is a bit more complicated. This one is called terminated lazy lists. Um, and I heard they were useful in some formalization of uh, Java memory model by some Andreas Lochbila a while ago. I, I think I've heard of that guy. Um, yes, so let's start with ordinary lazy lists. Those are like lists, but it's a co-inductive data type, meaning that now we also allow infinite values or so lists of infinite length that never stop. Um, terminated lists are a variant of those where the nil constructor has an additional parameter of a different type. Um, and here I indicated by a blue subs, uh, superscript. Um, and note that this additional parameter only is attached to finite lists, uh, finite lazy lists. The infinite lazy lists has not. So how can we view the terminated lazy lists as a quotient? Well, we need the additional annotations and we need the lazy lists and the quotient, uh, then the terminated lazy list naturally arises as a quotient of that, uh, of the pair. Namely, we take one lazy list and one element from here and we get one element of the terminated lazy list type. If you take a different pair, we get a different element. So this holds only for finite lazy lists. If you take an infinite lazy list, then regardless which uh, element from the second set we take, we will end up with the same uh, result element. So this is where the quotienting has to equate things. So in particular, this is how we can view terminated lazy lists as a quotient of the lazy list times B type. Um, namely, it's an equivalence relation on pairs. The first components have to be equal. And whenever the lazy lists are finite, the second components have to be equal, but only in the case. Well, the right, I see a problem there because obviously um, we don't get the same set of superscript uh, within the equivalence class um, if the list is infinite. Precisely. So if I check the conditions that we had from earlier, now we have two conditions about the set functions because for each parameter we have a second part condition and the second one simply does not hold in the case where access is an infinite list. Right. So we need to do a bit more work. So what do you suggest? Well, you see, let's boil this down to a very simple example. Let's consider lists again. And suppose we consider the equivalence relation that identifies all lists of length one. Now, the problem there seems to be uh, with terminated lazy lists that we have things built from atoms, but in the end, these atoms are not relevant um, ultimately in the equivalence clause. So we could just uh, introduce an artificial atom. So we could consider, rather than building uh, values over set A, we could tag the values using an option type with sum and then introduce a non-type, a non-value there. So we can, of course, inject that with the mapper into this larger set. Um, consider the equivalence class uh, over here. Um, and then 
Here, suddenly we have values that are built from the original atom and values that are not built from the original atoms in the same thing. Five minutes. So, thank you. So we could define setter as the set of all atoms that are actually used in every representative of this extended set. And so in this case, um, that should work. Sounds good. Okay, um, let me give it a try and do the proof. Well, the proof is in the paper. So we get this preservation theorem if we have a BNF with an equivalence relation that preserves wide intersections and weakly preserves pullbacks. The conditions are here, um, fairly complicated. But if we have that, then we get a bounded natural center also for the quotient um, by lifting the mapper and the rest is essentially this lifting construction going through the option type. The important part with the option type actually shows up here in the precondition that we can assume that everything's non-empty uh, because we can always put in none there. And that's the crucial part that allows us to do the lifting. Sounds good. So this should work for terminated list, lazy lists. And let me quickly implement this in Isabel and try out the command. So here are the terminated lazy lists again as a quotient of lazy lists. Uh, and now I use the lift BNF command, which I've just implemented uh, to lift the BNF structure. This gives me basically the same goals that Andreas just uh, presented. They may look a bit scary, but this is the case where the goals look scarier than the proofs are. The proofs are uh, each of uh, the goals is solved by one liner, so uh, not, not much to worry about. Uh, and after I've done this, now Isabel knows that TL list is a BNF. In particular, I can define data types that nest uh, recursively through the TL list type. That's great. So this was unexpectedly smooth. I tried a different example, namely the distinct list. And there I felt that proving the first condition, namely the pullback preservation or the subdistributivity was a bit complicated. Do you think we can uh, find something better, at least in the case where the atoms are the same? Well, let me see. So we're trying to prove something like that and now uh, distribute uh, the equivalence relation outside. So um, yeah, this works. How about that one? Um, what's that? Oh, that's just a construction that should simplify your proof. So informally, um, we can have the factor with an equivalence relation and the mapper preserves it and uh, the setter um, or the sets are the same. And now suppose you can approximate the equivalence relation with a rewrite relation. Mm -hmm. That is confluent. Mm -hmm. And the tricky bit, that factors through projections. So if I have a constructed value over tuples and I project to one component and then do a single rewrite step, then I can retract, I can find a y, y that is equivalent to the original x and that is, can be also projected to y. With that in place, then the conditions are also satisfied. So this is again sufficient. For distinct lists, I've tried that out. So we can use the rewrite relation that allows us to insert uh, an element that already occurs. And with that, the proof is actually only half as long as your pro manual proof that you did um, proving the subdistributivity explicitly. One minute. The interesting bit is the orientation. So this is in the opposite direction as you would normally expect. The reason for that is um, if we eliminate, if we re reoriented that, then we would eliminate um, this X here. Uh, but this X might not be eliminatable on the original part because a tuple gets reduced to just a single element. So we don't know that the other part is equal. Sounds really useful. Uh, in particular, the 50% shorter part. So let me try the same for regular expressions. And um, this is my attempt on the rewrite relation. Uh, the, most things are not interesting. The interesting bit is that I'm reusing your idea of inserting rather than removing duplication. Uh, and with that, uh, in about 400 lines, I can prove the properties that are required. In particular, the harvest proof is the confluence of uh, this relation. 
with that in place, with those four properties, the proof uh, of the conditions required for lifting the BNF structure on the 10 lines, or less. And with that in place, I can finally define my data type. Problem solved. That's great. OK, let me briefly summarize uh, what, what we have done in the paper also. Uh, so the main uh, tangible outcome for the Isabel user is the extension of the lift BNF command. This is already part of the current Isabel release. And uh, it lifts the BNF structure. What it also does is generates transfer rules such that the newly defined constants like the mapper, the set of the relator are linked to the original ones on the raw type. Um, so um, this has applications. We've shown you applications to data types. You can define now really new data types in Isabel that you could not define before. Uh, other applications include lifting and transfer. In particular, the relator structure is very relevant for the transfer tool. Um, and finally, there could be applications beyond uh, Isabel where uh, richer structures, such as uh, the quotients of polynomial factors, could be extended to cover the um, quotients where the sets of atoms are not the same for, for the equivalence classes. Uh, let me mention two limitations. So some structures are not BNFs. In particular, if you consider terms, module alpha equivalence, you need a generalization of BNF. Uh, and uh, we have figured out the details in the recent Popple paper. So I refer to that. Another um, type, quotient type from the literature that is not the BNF are signed multisets. So they are simply the naturality condition is violated by the way the type is constructed. And finally, as future work, we would like to look at partial quotients. So those are quotient types that simultaneously uh, include a subtype of types that combine a quotient and a subtype. And uh, currently, you can do the lifting of, BNF, of the BNF structure in two steps, but it would be nice to have a single step construction. And it would also be interesting to consider quotients of generalizations of BNFs. So those include the terms modulo alpha equivalence, which I already have mentioned. But there are also other useful generalizations, for example, to cover contravariant positions in pointers. This is it. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk and for the free theater. That was a special treat. Uh, we have time maybe for one quick question, if there's a question out there. So if there isn't, I'll, I'll ask a, a quick question. So what are the uh, uh, extra proof requirements on the user? So when a user wants to use a quotient, uh, what, uh, what, what burdens? Does the user have to fulfill? <laughs> yeah, so basically those. Yeah, that's right. Or um, abstractly, um, you need to prove that you have an equivalence relation. You need to prove that the wide intersection is preserved. But that's trivial if the setter is constant on the equivalence class. And the hard part is really the uh, weak pullback preservation, which can be uh, rather hard. So um, that's why we came up with the rewrite rule, a uh, rewrite system relation uh, to simplify those proofs. OK. And for that, you then need to have the other conditions proved. Yeah. Oh, one more question from Rene Timan. Uh, the question is, how do you control termination of the reversed distinct rule on slide 16? Well, it doesn't terminate, <laughs> uh, but you can nevertheless show confluence. Okay. Okay. So with that, that's a good place to stop. We're right on time. So let's try to stay on schedule. So again, uh, thank you for the talk.